Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow by Thomas de Quincey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow by Thomas de Quincey. Oftentimes at Oxford I saw Lavana in my dreams. I knew her by her Roman symbols. Who is Lavana, reader that do not pretend to have much leisure, for very much scholarship? You will not be angry with me for telling you. Lavana was the Roman goddess that performed for the newborn infant the earliest office of ennobling kindness, typical by its mode of that grandeur which belongs to man everywhere, and of that benignity and powers invisible which even in pagan worlds sometimes descends to sustain it. At the very moment of birth, just as the infant tasted for the first time the atmosphere of our troubled planet, it was laid on the ground. But immediately, lest so grand a creature should grovel there for more than one instant, either the paternal hand as proxy for the goddess Lavana, or some near kinsman as proxy for the father, raised it upright, bade it look erect as the king of all this world, and presented its forehead to the stars, saying, perhaps, in his heart, Behold what is greater than yourselves. This symbolic act represented the function of Lavana. And that mysterious lady, who never revealed her face except to me in dreams, but always acted by delegation, had her name from the Latin verb, as still it is the Italian verb, lavare, to raise aloft. This is the explanation of Lavana, and hence it has arisen that some people have understood by Lavana the tutelary power that controls the education of the nursery. She that would not suffer at his birth even a prefigurative or mimic degradation for her awful ward, far less could be supposed to suffer the real degradation attaching to the non-development of his powers. She therefore watches over human education. Now the word educo, with the penultimate short, was derived by a process often exemplified in the crystallization of languages from the word educo, with the penultimate long. Whatever educes or develops, educates. By the education of Lavana, therefore, is meant not the poor machinery that moves by spelling books and grammars, but by that mighty system of central forces hidden in the deep bosom of human life, which by passion, by strife, by temptation, by the energies of resistance, works forever upon children resting, not night or day, any more than the mighty wheel of day and night themselves, whose moments, like restless spokes, are glimmering for ever as they revolve. If, then, these are the ministries by which Lavana works, how profoundly must she reverence the agencies of grief? But you, reader, think that children are not liable to such grief as mine. There are two senses in the word generally. The sense of Euclid, where it means universally, or in the whole extent of the genus, and in a foolish sense of this word, where it means usually. Now, I am far from saying that children universally are capable of grief like mine, but there are more than you ever heard of who die of grief in this island of ours. I will tell you a common case. The rules of Eton require that a boy on the foundation should be there twelve years, he is superannuated at eighteen, consequently he must come at six. Children torn away from mothers and sisters at that age, not unfrequently, die. I speak of what I know. The complaint is not entered by the registrar as grief, but that it is. Grief of that sort, and at that age, has killed more than have ever been counted amongst its martyrs. Therefore it is that Lavana often communes with the powers that shake a man's heart. Therefore it is that she dotes on grief. These ladies, said I softly to myself on seeing the ministers with whom Lavana was conversing, these are the sorrows, and they are three in number, 
as the graces are three, who dress man's life with beauty, the passe are three, who weave the dark arras of man's life in their mysterious loom, always with colours sad in part, sometimes angry with tragic crimson and black. The furies are three, who visit with retribution, called from the other side of the grave, offences that walk upon this, and once even the muses were but three, who fit the harp, the trumpet, or the lute, to the great burdens of man's impassioned creations. These are the sorrows, all three of whom I know. The last words I say now, but in Oxford I said, one of whom I know, and others too surely I shall know. For already in my fervent youth I saw, dimly relieved upon the dark background of my dreams, the imperfect lineaments of the awful sisters. These sisters, by what name shall we call them? If I say simply, the sorrows, there will be a chance of mistaking the term. It might be understood of individual sorrow, separate cases of sorrow. Whereas I want a term expressing the mighty abstractions that incarnate themselves in all individual sufferings of man's heart, and I wish to have these abstractions presented as impersonations, that is, clothed with human attributes of life, and with functions pointing to flesh. Let us call them, therefore, our ladies of sorrow. I know them thoroughly, and have walked in all their kingdoms. Three sisters they are, of one mysterious household, and their paths are wide apart, but of their dominion there is no end. Them I saw often conversing with Lavana, and sometimes about myself. Do they talk then? Oh, no! Might a phantoms like these disdain the infirmities of language? They may utter voices through the organs of man when they dwell in human hearts, but amongst themselves there is no voice nor sound. Eternal silence reigns in their kingdoms. They spoke not, as they talked with Lavana, they whispered not, they sang not, though oftentimes, methought, they might have sung, for I, upon earth, had heard their mysteries oftentimes deciphered by harp and timbrel by dulcimer and organ. Like God, whose servants they are, they utter their pleasure, not by sounds that perish or by words that go astray, but by signs in heaven, by changes on earth, by pulses in secret rivers, heraldries painted on darkness, and hieroglyphs written on the tablets of the brain. They wheeled in mazes, I spelled the steps, they telegraphed from afar, I read the signals, they conspired together, and on the mirrors of darkness, my eye traced the plots, theirs were the symbols, mine are the words. What is it the sisters are? What is it that they do? Let me describe their form and their presence. If form it were that still fluctuated in its outline, or presence it were that forever advanced to the front, or forever receded amongst shades. The eldest of the three is named Mater Lacrimarum, Our Lady of Tears. She it is that night and day raves and moans calling for vanished faces. She stood in Rama, where a voice was heard of lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted. She it was that stood in Bethlehem on the night when Herod's sword swept its nurseries of innocence, and the little feet were stiffened for ever, which, heard at times as they tottered along floors overhead, woke pulses of love in household hearts that were not unmarked in heaven. Her eyes are sweet and subtle, wild and sleepy by turns, oftentimes rising to the clouds, oftentimes challenging the heavens. She wears a diadem round her head, and I knew by childish memories that she could go abroad on the winds when she heard the sobbing of litanies or the thundering of organs and when she beheld the mustering of summer clouds. This sister, the eldest, it is, that carries keys more than papal at her girdle which open every cottage and every palace. She, to my knowledge, sat all last summer by the bedside of the blind beggar, him that so often and so gladly I talked with, whose pious daughter, eight years old, with sunny countenance, resisted the temptations of play and village mirth to travel all day long on dusty roads with her afflicted father. 
For this did God send her a great reward. In the springtime of the year, and whilst yet her own spring was budding, he recalled her to himself. But her blind father mourns for ever over her. Still he dreams at midnight that the little guiding hand is locked within his own. And still he wakens to a darkness that is now, within a second and a deeper darkness. This mater lacrimarum has also been sitting all this winter of 1844-85 within the bedchamber of the Tsar, bringing before his eyes a daughter no less pious, that vanished to God not less suddenly, and left behind her a darkness not less profound. By the power of the keys it is that our Lady of Tears glides a ghostly intruder into the chambers of sleepless men, sleepless women, sleepless children, from Ganges to Nile, from Nile to Mississippi, and her, because she is the firstborn of her house, and has the widest empire, let us honour with the title of Madonna. The second sister is called Mater Suspiriorum, Our Lady of Sighs. She never scales the clouds, nor walks abroad upon the winds. She wears no diadem, and her eyes, if they were ever seen, would be neither sweet nor subtle. No man could read their story. They would be found filled with perishing dreams and with wrecks of forgotten delirium. But she raises not her eyes. Her head, on which sits a dilapidated turban, droops for ever, and for ever fastens on the dust. She weeps not. She groans not. But she sighs inaudibly at intervals. Her sister Madonna is oftentimes stormy and frantic, raging in the highest against heaven, and demanding back her darlings. But... Our Lady of Sighs never clamours, never defies, dreams not of rebellious aspirations. She is humble to abjectness. Hers is the meekness that belongs to the hopeless. Murmur she may, but it is in her sleep. Whisper she may, but it is to herself in the twilight. Mutter she does at times, but it is in solitary places that are desolate, as she is desolate, in ruined cities, and when the sun has gone down to his rest. This sister is the visitor of the pariah, of the Jew, of the bondsman to the oar in the Mediterranean galleys, and of the English criminal in Norfolk Island, blotted out from the books of remembrance in sweet far-off England, of the baffled penitent, reverting his eyes for ever upon a solitary grave, which to him seems the altar overthrown of some past and bloody sacrifice, on which altar no oblations can now be availing, whether towards pardon that he might implore, or towards repatriation that he might attempt. Every slave that at noonday looks up to the tropical sun with timid reproach, as he points with one hand to the earth our general mother, but for him a stepmother, as he points with his other hand to the Bible our general teacher, but against him sealed and sequestered, Every woman sitting in darkness, without love to shelter her head, or hope to illumine her solitude, because the heaven-born instincts kindling in her nature, germs of holy affections which God implanted in her womanly bosom, have been stifled by social necessities, now burn sullenly to waste, like sepulchral lamps amongst the ancients. Every nun defrauded of her unreturning maytime by wicked kinsmen, whom God will judge, every captive in every dungeon, all that are betrayed and all that are rejected outcasts by traditionary law and children of hereditary disgrace, all these walk with Our Lady of Sighs. She also carries a key, but she needs it little for her kingdom, is chiefly amongst the tents of Shem and the houseless vagrant of every clime, yet in the very highest walks of man she finds chapels of her own. And even in glorious England there are some that, to the world, carry their heads as proudly as the reindeer, who yet secretly have received her mark upon their foreheads. But the third sister, who is also the youngest, hush, whisper whilst we talk of her, her kingdom is not large, or else no flesh should live, but within that kingdom all power is hers, her head turreted like that of Sibel, 
rises almost beyond the reach of sight she droops not and her eyes rising so high might be hidden by distance but being what they are they cannot be hidden through the treble veil of crape which she wears the fierce light of a blazing misery that rests not for matins or for vespers for noon of day or noon of night for ebbing or for flowing tide may be read from the very ground she is the defier of god she is also the mother of lunacies and the suggestress of suicides deep lie the roots of her power but narrow is the nation she rules for she can approach only those in whom a profound nature has been upheaved by central convulsions in whom the heart trembles and the brain rocks under conspiracies of tempest from without and tempest from within madonna moves with uncertain steps fast or slow but still with tragic grace our lady of sighs creeps timidly and stealthily but this youngest sister moves with incalculable motions bounding and with tiger's leaps she carries no key for though coming rarely amongst men she storms all doors at which she is permitted to enter at all and her name is mater tenebrarum our lady of darkness these were the semni theae or sublime goddesses these were the eumenides or gracious ladies so called by antiquity in shuddering appropriation of my oxford dreams madonna spoke she spoke by her mysterious hand touching my head she said to our lady of sighs and what she spoke translated out of the signs which except in dreams no man reads was this lo here is he whom in childhood i dedicated to my altars this is he that once i made my darling him i led astray him i beguiled and from heaven i stole away his young heart to mine through me did he become idolatrous and through me it was by languishing desires that he worshipped the worm and prayed to the wormy grave holy was the grave to him lovely was its darkness saintly its corruption him this young idolater i have seasoned for thee dear gentle sister of sighs do thou take him now to thy heart and season him for our dreadful sister and thou turning to the mater tenebrorum she said wicked sister that temptest and hatest do thou take him from her see that thy sceptre lie heavy on his head suffer not woman and her tenderness to sit near him in his darkness banish the frailties of hope wither the relenting of love scorch the fountain of tears curse him as only thou canst curse so shall he be accomplished in the furnace so shall he see the things that ought not to be seen sights that are abominable and secrets that are unutterable so shall he read elder truths sad truths grand truths fearful truths so shall he rise again before he dies and so shall our commission be accomplished which from god we had to plague his heart until we had unfolded the capacities of his spirit end of lavana and our ladies of sorrow recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia